Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us so early on Halloween. Um, we are. <laughs> we are, just so you're aware, we are streaming to our other campuses. Um, we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to benefit from this session as well. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Sarah Gon. I'm the Inclusion and Diversity Specialist here. Um, I manage a Inclusion and Diversity Circle, and they requested that we put some priority on LGBT inclusion this year. So. That is what we've been doing. Uh, and we are lucky enough to have become members of Pride at Work Canada. And we are joined today by Colin. I'll give you his bio. Colin Drewhan is the Executive Director for Pride at Work Canada, where he is committed to improving the climate of inclusiveness in Canadian workplaces for LGBTQ2 people. In addition to that role, he serves on the National Advisory Committee for Diverse City on Board, and the Program Advisory Committee for the Arts Administration and Cultural Management Program at Humber College. Previous to this role, he had positions at George Brown College, the 519, TIFF, and Inside Out Toronto LGBT Film and Video Festival. So welcome, and I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Um, and my presentation today is called Beyond Pride LGBTQ2 Plus Workplace Inclusion, but you're not going to hear me use, I don't really like using the acronym very much, so I'm going to try and not use it as much as possible um, in my presentation. Um, so like Sarah said, Algonquin College is a regional partner of uh, Pride at Work Canada. Um, for those of you who aren't quite sure um, what it is that Pride at Work Canada is or does, um, we're a national organization that um, provides consulting services, education and training um, to employers around their um, uh, diversity inclusion strategies as it pertains to um, sexual orientation, gender identity uh, and gender expression. Um, so a little bit more about me, Sarah gave you a little bit of information about my, my work history. Um, I've been the executive director of Pride at Work Canada since 2014. It's actually uh, next week's my four year anniversary, so woo. Um, I'm also a staff writer for In Magazine, which is Canada's only national print publication um, for gender and sexual minorities, um, where I mostly write about community engagement, employment, and poverty in the community. So look up my articles and share them out on social media. Um, uh, I also, like, uh, like Sarah said, I, I, I sit on a couple committees. Um, I'm pretty enthusiastic about my role. Um, uh, the pronouns that I use are he, him, his. Uh, I identify as queer, cis man. I'm a white settler who was born and raised in Nova Scotia. I begrudgingly live in Toronto for now, looking for ways to move back there. Um, and just a little bit more about me. Um, my life goal at the moment is to watch all of the AFI's uh, top 100 American movies. I'm at 65 right now. Uh, I have a partner who only watches Marvel movies, so it's kind of hard to fit those other movies into my schedule. Uh, and I avoid playing team sports at all costs. Um, it's in I always like being on a microphone because I always talk about how my first like encounter with um, uh, like workplace harassment or discrimination was my first job was in rural Nova Scotia at a fast food restaurant at a bus station, so it's super glamorous. And I, I really, really liked it, um, but they wouldn't let me work on the drive-through because they said that my voice was too gay on the drive-through microphone. And now I just make my full-time living talking on microphones all the time about <laughs> you know, stuff that's gay and queer and bi and trans. So uh, it's funny how things work out. Uh, so a little bit more about what I do and kind of the tapestry of, of organizations um, that serve the community uh, in Canada. So Pride at Work Canada, we're a not-for-profit member service agency. We're not a charitable organization. We don't provide direct-to-client services, so we don't take private donations. We think that money is better served with uh, places like Community in, in uh, Vancouver, where they do provide direct-to-client services. They provide in-person education and training to the general public. Um, sometimes people think that we're a pride festival, um, like Halifax Pride or you know um, Capital Pride that you have here in Ottawa. Those uh, organizations operate more as kind of like seasonal musical festivals um, where they, f uh, they focus on talent um, from the community or talent that's popular with the community. They do some social programming and educational programming um, and they usually do a broad, you know, uh, I know Halifax Pride for example, they do a good amount of work engaging with youth and then um, elder populations as well. So, uh, but they're more kind of seasonal festivals. And then there's organizations like Travel Gay Canada, that's more of a professional association for um, businesses that are owned by gender and sexual minorities in Canada. So just to give you a sense of kind of how we fit in, a lot of people think that we're like owned and operated by a pro like by Pride Toronto or, or something, but we're, we're an independent organization. 
I saw you have one of these flags out front. That's great. Did anybody go to the flag raising? Yeah, awesome. How was it? Was it good? Yeah. Um, I have a little quiz for you. Do you know what the colors for the most modern rainbow flag stand for? Does anybody know? No? Nobody ever knows. It's fine. So we've got red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, violet. So red is for life. Uh, he, uh, orange is for healing. Yellow is for sunlight. Green is for nature. Indigo is for harmony. And spirit is violet. That's why they have spirit day. Mostly in the States, everybody wears those ugly purple shirts. So the original pride flag actually had two other stripes. There was a pink stripe that was for sex and a turquoise stripe that was for magic. I'm still waiting for my magic powers to kick in. Um, Gilbert Baker was the person who designed that flag. Um, he designed it in, uh, I think it was 1978, for Harvey Milk to fly at the uh, um, Gay Freedom Day Parade in San Francisco. It was less than a year later that Harvey Milk was assassinated uh, and died um, during his first year in office um, with the uh, municipality of San Francisco. Um, so the flag does mean a lot to a lot of people, but I like to point out that the original flag was hand sewn and hand dyed, and it actually contained those, those two colors of pink and turquoise. So Gilbert Baker, once the, the flag took on more popularity and wanted to be mass produced, he actually removed the pink and turquoise stripes from the design because in the 70s, those dyes were incredibly uh, expensive to source and it was prohibitive for a lot of smaller uh, pride organizations that really wanted to have this symbol and share it out and help it become kind of a symbol for the movement. Um, so I'd just like to point out that, you know, sometimes people talk about how some of the language that we use in this space changes all the time and some of the symbols we use and, you know, sometimes people approach others and say, you know, I don't feel particularly included. This is a really clear sign that our community does have a long history of changing and trying to open up things to make them more accessible and provide more opportunity. Uh, and that's really something that I think we try and do at Pride to Work Canada, because we're really about opening up economic opportunity, not just for the employers that we work with, but for the community who face incredible barriers to uh, employment. So I talk about how important that flag symbol is to some people. So understandably, I get a little bit miffed when I see things like this. Um, I don't like this Apple ad. It's not the correct colors from the flag. They're not in the correct order. I'm the type of person that goes into stores and tells them when their pride flag is upside down. I do it respectfully and I ask them, do you want me to help you flip it so that it's, uh, it's right side up and people are usually helpful. I don't really like it when corporations put their logo on top of the flag like this. Um, it's, a, it's a symbol that means a lot to a lot of people. And I think that when you use it without the knowledge of that history or even being able to name what those colors mean, uh, I think it shows a lack of respect for where we've come from and where we need to go as a community. So that's a little bit about uh, the values that we have at Pride at Work Canada. So today I have a few goals that I worked on with Sarah for, for everybody. I want folks to understand and define the grounds of sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. I think it's really important for us to understand um, those grounds and how they're reflected in human rights legislation in Canada. Uh, we want folks to become familiar with some key challenges faced by gender and sexual minorities, specifically in Canada. Uh, I'm going to identify some important gaps in many employers' inclusion strategies. Um, I adapted this presentation from a really longer, a much longer, drier one that was about is focuses on policy, but I took a lot of that stuff out for you folks, so that we can talk a little bit about some key ways that individuals can contribute to inv inclusive environments, particularly in the workplace. Um, so like I said, you know, I know that everybody comes to the table with various levels of knowledge on the subject matter. So some of this stuff is going to be, you know, very rudimentary to some of you. Some of it's going to be new to some of you. So we just ask for everybody to hang in there together. We'll get through this hour as a group. Um, and it's not going to make you an expert. I'm just throwing some ideas out there. Uh, but you can find some more resources on our website and, you know, beyond. So uh, first I'll start, start talking about those grounds that we talked about. So um, one of the things that I really like to make sure that there's a common understanding of anytime I do a talk is the difference between um, sex and gender. Um, so when we think about sex, it's really a medical classification that's based on physical characteristics uh, or chromosomes. Um, and then when we talk about um, an individual sex, we really talk about their sex assigned at birth. So when a person's born, a medical professional or, or a birthing professional or the parents will take a look at, at a kid and they take a, a, make an assessment based on the, on the physicality of the child and say uh, they make a, a, a judgment on, on what the sex is of that kid without any 
consent because the kid can't really weigh in at that point. Um, so a lot of us are kind of burdened with this assignment um, uh, when, we're, when we're born. Um, the, when we talk about gender identity, or I usually just say gender, um, it's really it's the intangible part of our who we are. You know, it's just our individual experience of you know being a man, being a woman, not subscribing to the idea that those are the only options for a person um, to identify as, uh, or you know people who are uh, identify as non-binary, um, you know gender non-conforming, any number of ways. We'll we'll go into some more definitions as we go down the road, but it's just your sense of of you know how you relate to various stereotypes and um, you know established norms about gender. Um, and identity. And then gender expression are the ways that we perform gender outwardly to other people. So this can either align with our gender identity um, or it cannot. Um, but you know, when we think about gender expression, we often think about stereotypes. You know, um, I think I have a pretty stereotypical like uh, gender expression right now for guys. I'm wearing a plaid shirt and you know pants. Um, you know, usually you associate things like makeup and long hair with, with women. These are, these are stereotypes. There's no biological imperative for those things to be related to men or women or, or folks who um, are, are non-binary. Uh, but the, they're just uh, they're symbols that we use to express who we are to the outside world. So is everybody cool on, on those definitions? Make sense? Awesome. Seeing a lot of nodding. So when we talk about sexual orientation, um, it's really, again, like, kind of like gender. It's something that's not tangible. Um, and it's just a personal characteristic that really focuses on your emotional, romantic, or sexual feelings toward other people. And it's really more about the attraction that we feel or the, um, the you know, who we are now and, and kind of who we see ourselves moving forward, having relationships with, having sex with. Um, it's not necessarily about our history. So, you know, don't make assumptions about a person's orientation based on their history or, you know, little clues that you have about them. Um, you know, don't assume that because you see somebody who identifies as a woman holding hands with another person who identifies as a woman that they're both, uh, they did both identify as lesbian. Um, they could both be bi or, you know, one of them could identify as queer instead of uh, lesbian. So, you know, don't, I don't like people being little sexual orientation detectives where they find like one piece of information about somebody and they, la they go and label them. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go on. Um, it's also important to recognize that people kind of define their sexual orientation at different points in their life based on, you know, what's in the here and now and what's moving forward. So somebody could be married to somebody of another gender for a long time and then leave that marriage and get together with somebody of the same gender. It doesn't classify them as bisexual. They might just say, you know what, I'm articulating my sexual orientation as gay now and, and that's who I am. It doesn't matter that I've had um, uh, relationships with people of other genders in the past. So does everybody understand that concept too? Oh my god, we're rolling along great. This is wonderful. So um, these grounds are all reflected in the various human rights legislation that we see in Canada. So we actually have, um, I focus on employment, obviously. So there's protections in a number of different areas. But we do have employment protections at every jurisdictional level in Canada, um, at the, every provincial and territorial uh, piece of uh, human rights legislation has these grounds. The Canadian Human Rights Act um, has these grounds. Um, so it is really important uh, to understand that um, we are all protected from discrimination. And I, I do underscore that we are all protected. So these protections don't exist just for people who identify as members of the community that I'm talking about. There are lots of people who identify as uh, straight who you know may have a gender expression or you know they might not identify as as queer or trans but they might have a gender expression that is not expected of them they might not do gender in a way that people uh, expect them to and these protections aren't here to give special rights to a small group of people they're here to protect all Canadians so that we can all um, live freely as ourselves so I want to talk a little bit about uh, acronyms uh, I like to say you know LGBT WTF um, there's lots of different initialisms and acronyms that we use to represent the community. Um, there's not really, there's no global standard. So, you know, I get, you know, I was in a meeting with a couple like high level communications executives trying to give them some training on language one day. And before we even started, they were all fighting over, well, my daughter said it's LGBTQ. And somebody was like, well, my son said it's this. And that's not long enough. I just, I don't really like using acronyms very much because somebody is always left out. 
uh, uh, like eventually somebody is left out, somebody is not included, and that's not really the kind of stage that we like to set at Pride at Work Canada. So when we kind of need to, we use LGBTQ2+, but in general, you'll hear me talk about you know, the community, you know, queer and trans folks, uh, gender and sexual minorities, people who don't do gender in a way that's expected of them. I try and find these like, little tools to get around using acronyms. Um, because I think that this has been a tool that the community's used for a long time and it's grown and expanded, but I think there's an increasing number of folks who feel that it's not representative of who they are, uh, and I think it's important to, to pay attention to that. So I'm going to try and do some fancy footwork around, um, around these, uh, these acronyms. And because, like, what does it all mean anyway? Like, these are these are a lot of the different words that you know and terms that I, I see around. Some of them are more kind of focused on like when we work in the in me, like medical services, um, in in when you're doing research around healthcare, it's more important to focus on people's behaviors than it is to focus on their identity. So labeling somebody as queer isn't super helpful to a public health nurse, but saying this is a man who has sex with men, so MSM. Um, that's more helpful for a nurse to be able to make an assessment about how to how to look at that how to look at that data because you're looking at the person's sexual behavior and associating you know various risks uh, risks there um, you know like I said there's lots of different where you know some people you know identify as bisexual but some people because they are not attracted they're attracted to more than one gender but they don't subscribe to the that binary idea of, of gender they might be uh, pansexual so there's all kinds of different words that we use here which is again why I try and get away from being those identity detectives that people tend to be I mean we could do a whole we could do a whole one hour session where I just give you definitions of all of these things how practical is that in your daily life no everybody's shaking their head yeah it's not super practical because like I said if you find out one piece of information about me and then maybe another little piece of information down the road, you're going to start making an assessment of who I am, and then you're going to imprint on me, well, that is what a queer cis guy is. Uh, so every time you meet somebody else, there's a chance that you, know, you might project some of my values onto that person, which really isn't um, what we're trying to do. So we're going to stay a little way, uh, away from some of these definitions, and we're just going to we'll talk about that at the end when we talk about being good allies. But what I like to do is just let people explain to me who they are, and if they give me language that they want me to use, it's my responsibility as a good human being to mirror that language back to them. That's kind of just the way that I, I look at it, rather than trying to memorize all these terms. Because I identify as queer, but my definition of queer is worlds apart from uh, you know, my friend Jen, who also identifies as queer. And it doesn't mean that we're in disagreement. It just means that I have a definition that works for me. She has a definition that works for her. And uh, we love each other, so the, and we respect each other's um, way of being. So that's really kind of how I, how I look at all of these definitions. So moving on to major issues. Before I do that, is any everybody okay to move on? Does that everything I just talked about sit right with everybody, and it, it feels like you can you can deal with that information before we move on to the next part? Okay, great. So the next thing I want to talk about are some major issues that we see. Um, in the community. And this is really why we do the work that we do at Pride of Work Canada. And it's, this is what we try to make available to employers as much as possible. Uh, within the community that we deal with, we see a lot, we in, increased experiences with violence. Um, so trans people in, in both in Canada and the US um, report high levels of violence, harassment, discrimination when seeking stable housing, employment, health, or social services. Um, it's important to note that bisexual women as a demographic face higher rates of sexual violence in Canada than any other, any other group. Um, hate crimes against gender and sexual minorities are among the most violent, with 65% of them involving assault. And actually, very recently, we saw a spike in um, hate crimes uh, based on sexual orientation in Canada. Um, I also like to point out that we can't really rely on some of the data that we have about hate crimes um, just because I think a lot of time there's small incidences of hate that happen that don't get reported um, that we need to be conscious of. So when we see the documentation of hate crimes in Canada, you have to look at the bigger picture of are there lots of things happening that people don't bother reporting because they happen so often? Or are there folks who don't feel comfortable reporting because they've had bad experiences doing it before where you know, it didn't really go anywhere for them? Or you know, it's not a person who's known to them, so they know there's no chance that anything's going to happen because they wouldn't be able to identify the, the person anyway. But I just like to kind of, it's a little bit more complicated than the numbers that we see. But the numbers that we do see are not great. 
We see worse mental health outcomes in the community. Um, we see a lot of folks um, with higher rates of depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive and phobic disorders, suicidality, self-harm and substance, and substance use. Um, queer and trans people are at double the risk for uh, PTSD uh, because of the increased experiences with violence that we talked about. Um, queer and trans youth are at 14 times the risk of suicide and substance abuse than their peers. And this is an old stat that's from 2012. It's getting a bit stale, but in this uh, trans pulse survey that was done here in Ontario, 77% of uh, respondents said they had seriously considered suicide and 45% had attempted suicide. So, yeah. I just have a question. <clears throat> on your previous slide. Mm -hmm. Hi there. I just have a question on your previous slide. Uh, I think it was saying that hate crime, here it is, but hate crimes based on sexual orientation in Canada saw a 25% jump in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, what is, in your opinion, the reason for this? Uh, my, I don't have, like, I haven't, like, delved into that research too much. I think it's increased reporting. Like, I don't think that it's a spike in activity. I think it's more people coming forward okay. with, the, with the information. I think more people are becoming aware of their rights uh, and are actively, or, you know, developing better relationships with folks to whom that they would report. That's my estimation, because I don't think that there's been a huge surge in, like, anti, uh, like, queer and trans activity in Canada. I, 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 that's what w my estimation would be, but I don't have any evidence that I've found to back that up, but that's kind of how I interpret the okay. stuff that I've read. Does that help? Yeah, for yeah, sure. Great. Thank you. Um, so all of these things contribute, you know, or, or uh, are uh, exacerbated by limited access to employment, which is really what we focus on at Pride of Work Canada. So, you know, between five to ten of the of the Canadian population identifies as a member of this community. It's a it's a lot higher among younger younger folks. So we see that percentage going up. Um, but of the 150,000 people in Canada who find themselves um, without a home. 25% of them are a member of this community. So there's a big discrepancy there, where there's a relatively small amount of the populations disproportionately impacted by um, uh, income and, and housing insecurity. Um, and you know, a lot of this has contributed, uh, a lot of the, uh, the lack of a, like a supportive network. A lot of kids are really leaving home at a younger age or losing the support of their, of their immediate or extended family at a younger age. It's really difficult for those folks to get, a, get their first job. I got my first job because my dad had a friend who knew somebody at the at that fast food restaurant that I worked at, and you know I was able to get that crappy job. Um, and then I threw a friend at school. I you know their mom was hiring at some other thing. So we we meet people through interesting ways getting our first job, and that's really how we enter the workforce. And it sets us up for you know a level of success that some people just don't have. Um, and then some recent research. Um, uh, that just came out that queer and trans students are more adversely impacted by student debt than their peers because they often don't have the same um, supplemental support from their families as other folks. Um, one of the most arresting statistics that I find is that um, while 71% of trans people, uh, this is specific to Ontario, have at least some college or university education, about half make um, $15,000 per year uh, or less. Um, so you can, you can imagine that if this was the stat for everybody who had a, a university or college education, um, then it would be considered a, a huge crisis. But because it's happening to uh, what a lot of people perceive as a relatively small uh, population, it's, it's not seen as a, a, a huge deal to a lot of folks. But I think that it is a huge deal. I think it should be a, a huge deal to more people. Um, this is a, a group of people that you know should have, according to our human rights legislation, should have the same access to employment uh, and opportunity as everybody else. Um, so this is from a study that we did with a few other uh, a few other partners a couple of years ago, where we found where we asked um, people about discrimination in the workplace. So when we we talked to people who identified as members of this community and people who didn't, and 67% um, of the folks who did not identify as members of the community said that there's no discrimination against. Um, uh, queer and trans folks in the workplace. It just doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist anymore. But then we have stats like this. So clearly there's a disconnect between their experience of the workplace and the experience of, of other folks um, because we see 38.3% of folks uh, from the, uh, from the uh, uh, queer and trans group said that there wasn't discrimination, but everybody else said that they um, had either, you know, they didn't know or they witnessed or they experienced discrimination. So there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, a gap there. 
Um, so we're going to move on to talk about you know, what are some of the gaps in workplace inclusion strategy and kind of how um, that might contribute uh, to some of the things that uh, some of the, the stats that we just saw. I'm going to base this on, um, we published a, in partnership with Great Place to Work uh, Canada in January 2017, um, an LGBT best practice guide for employers. Um, and we use data from, we have a benchmarking tool at Pride to Work Canada that we use to, um, we don't really use it to score companies, we use it as a tool to kind of give them some focused feedback on um, what it is that they can do to improve based on their business model. Um, so some, it's called uh, the, our uh, Workplace Inclusion Index. Sometimes it gets compared to HRC has a corporate equality index in the states. Um, in the United States, there's no federal protections on, on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity or gender expression. So companies, I think, need to be a little bit more competitive. There's 35 states where you can be fired legally for your sexual orientation. And there's even more, as we see now, that are introducing actively discriminatory laws around gender identity and gender expression. Um, so there, it's a whole other ball of wax down there. Uh, but for us, we don't really like doing things like s listing scores or these are the top employers for queer folks in Canada. Um, we more like to use it as an opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with employers um, to show them how they can improve. You know, the, the recommendations that we would give Algonquin College are very different from the ones that we would give, you know, a very large bank um, or, you know, an investment firm or something like that. So we like to, we don't like to give everybody a, a one-shot tool to, to um, measure what they're doing. So, so we like to do things on an individual basis. Um, great place to work. Um, is a for-profit enterprise that does benchmarking as well. So they do lists like you know the top employers in Canada, this, that, and the other thing. So they do collect a lot of data about employers. So they did us a favor and shared some of the data that they have, and we mixed it with the data that we have. And then we looked at what employers were doing around these issues, and we came up with a you know 12 points. I'm not saying these are the these are the only 12 things. We are just saying that these are the 12 things that not a lot of employers are doing that they really should be doing. So um, now that we have that, I'll go through a little bit. Um, the first three, uh, first one is about putting it in writing. So we really want to make sure that you know we have those grounds that I talked about in the human rights legislation in Canada. But it's also really important for us to have them in internal policies because we want to make sure that employees and folks that are uh, like you know operating under our roof they understand that there's a, an additional commitment from the employer uh, to uphold those, those, uh, those rights. Um, so we like to see all the three of the grounds, the gender expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation, we like to see those um, reflected in harassment, discrimination policy, anti-bullying policy, that sort of thing. Um, we like folks to use gender neutral language as much as possible, thinking about you know, getting away from things like he slash she and into using um, they as a, a, you know, a singular, uh, singular pronoun. Um, we, we, in, in, we encourage this across all different types of policies, um, you know, particularly bereavement policies where, you know, I've read bereavement policies where it says, you know, when, when the employee loses his wife and, you know, that kind of thing. So there, some of the language can be quite dated and people, and if they're not thinking about it, they just don't update these things year over year. And then you can go back and a policy from like 1990 can, can re read almost like it's in a foreign language sometimes. I started a job and I, I remember looking up, um, the, this was years ago, and I remember looking up one of the policies and it said something about, you know, not asking about somebody, if somebody was married, because same gender marriage was not legal in Canada and it might out someone. And I mean, this was well after it was legalized. So that was a, in a policy and it, like they just hadn't, it stagnated for years. So little examples like that where it's important to go back and make sure that things read as relevant to everyone. Um, and similarly with uh, benefits being relevant to all employees, we wanna make sure that benefits um, are, you know, the reason that we have benefits is to have a healthy and happy workforce that's productive. So if there's a whole group of folks um, that are under the roof of the employer who aren't accessing the benefits at the same level as everybody else because they don't feel that when they read them it applies to them. Um, thinking specifically about somebody who um, might identify um, as a you know identify as a man but still need some uh, medical procedures or, or checkups um, that are associated with body parts that people might stereotypically associate with um, uh, people being a woman. Um, you know we want to make sure that everybody has access to everything um, 
so that they can be as happy and healthy as they can. So bereavement policies, um, you know, medical benefits, um, time off policies, um, anything around adoption support. We want to make sure that all of that reads as relevant to everyone. Um, and we want to make sure that we have um, a level of, of benefits that are going to support everyone. So people, uh, you know, I know HIV AIDS is uh, something that um, has been tackled very, very well by medications over the years. Those medications are extremely pricey, very, very expensive. So are um, things like, uh, like PrEP, which people can take um, to prevent um, from becoming HIV positive. They're very, very expensive. So really good drug plans are things that attract um, some, some members of the community to some employers over, the, over others. So we want to make sure that we hit a couple points um, around medical benefits. Kind of part and parcel with that is that we want to make sure that um, employers are supporting gender, gender transition in the workplace. So of the survey we did, only 11% of organizations actually have benefits packages that cover medical transition related costs. Not everybody who transitions is going to take every medical step that's available to them. Some people, everybody's going to do it a little bit differently, um, but everybody should have access to everything that's available. And um, so one of the things that consistently baffles me is kind of like the lack of consistency across Canada when it comes to transition-related medical care. Um, and this can be anything from, uh, you know, uh, counseling to hormones to um, different medications to surgeries. Um, and it's, it's very difficult uh, in different parts of the country for people to access this care. So if employers can kind of fill the gaps that are left uh, by provinces in this regard, um, it can be really helpful. Um, and it's a big blind spot for a lot of organizations. So other things that we recommend, uh, you know, implementing organization-wide diversity training. Um, there's a lot of specifics that we get into on this because, you know, obviously if you make training mandatory to a large group of people, it's going to become kind of a chore and it's not going to be picked up properly. So there's really specifics that we uh, some specific recommendations we have around training, but we do think that training and education should be, uh, you know, a big part of the, of the strategy for any employer. And we want to see specific training for people managers and people who are hiring. We did a whole report about this. It's called Hiring Across All Spectrums. And what we see is we see a lot of really enthusiastic people who are recruiters, who are very active um, within their employer, and they are hip to the diversity strategy, and they're great uh, advocates for, for uh, you know, their place of work, and they're getting all these great diverse applicants, and those applicants are sitting in on interviews that make them feel like garbage, because the people that they're being stewarded to haven't gotten the same training and are you know, really derailing that, uh, that entry pipeline for some folks from, from this community. I talked to a lot of people across Canada who are super, super qualified. They didn't have any problem finding a job before they transitioned. Uh, then they transition and suddenly they're unhirable for some odd reason. Um, you know, they're just not a good fit. Um, that's what they're hearing over and over and over again. Um, or, you know, we have p folks who, you know, they, they have a good time getting an interview, they go in, and then they get feedback that, you know, they weren't a great fit. And, it's, you know, this happens. I, I was talking to, did a roundtable with a number of women in Toronto um, this week that was specifically about um, the experience of queer and trans women in the workplace. And a lot of uh, them were saying that they've had experiences where they knew they had to dress kind of girly in the interview. And then maybe once they got the job, they could go back to wearing the clothes that really they felt suited them. Um, and that was a big theme in the, in the small group that we were, we were talking to. So uh, I think you know, this idea of inter interviews are stressful for everyone, as it is. They can be even more stressful if you feel that you don't fit in um, in, in, the, in the workplace environment. So it's really important for people managers and hiring managers to kind of know this stuff going into those processes. Uh, we also really encourage supporting employee resource groups. Um, and the, does anybody uh, know what an employee resource group is? No? So an employee resource group is something that's very common, mostly in, in corporate environments, where the organization will provide resources and kind of an, a, usually an executive sponsor um, to a group of employees that are kind of form um, around uh, you know, a shared identity or shared values. So you know, we see a lot of uh, organizations doing a pride employee resource group for uh, you know, gender and sexual minority employees and allies. Um, sometimes they're around 
around um, you know race or ethnicity. So you know we work with a lot of organizations that have like a, a black employees group, an Asian employees group, um, and we we see lots of uh, we see lots of them on different on different fronts. We think they're really important. Um, I know a lot of the employ the uh, um, a lot of the employers that we work with at Pride Work Canada are federally regulated, so they have to do specific reporting around the Employment Equity Act. So the Employment Equity Act identifies um, women, um, uh, Indigenous folks, uh, people with disabilities, and what the Act calls visible minorities. Um, so those are the four groups that those federally regulated employers need to report back on. And a lot of federally regulated employers, they have employee res resource groups around those four groups. Um, but we really think it's important to kind of expand out or get a little bit more granular. Um, so you know, don't just have a group for um, you know, uh, visible minorities, have different groups based on uh, you know, different um, ethnicities or, or cultural backgrounds. Um, so one of the real, really big reasons why we think employee, employee, employers excuse me, should have these groups, and sometimes they're called ERGs, employee resource groups, sometimes they're called infinity group, uh, affinity groups, excuse me, sometimes they're called um, you know, diversity councils. Um, they, provide a, they provide space and resources. Um, uh, the employers provide space and resources as a kind of a starting point. Um, but engaging with them is a really good way of uh, making a big difference. Um, like, I'll tell you a little story kind of to illustrate how this works. Uh, we worked with a, a large Canadian company that I, w I won't name, um, but their HR team um, noticed a couple, a couple people were coming forward with complaints about, you know, uh, inappropriate language in the workplace. So their response was to put up a whole bunch of rainbow posters and say, this is a safe space. Uh, saying a safe uh, place is safe is, doesn't really actually do anything. So uh, like I can go into a war zone and put up a, this is a safe space. And like I think everybody's still going to feel like very threatened. Um, so they got huge backlash from a lot of folks who were coming to HR and saying, listen, I'm, I'm a lesbian, and I'm not out at work. And you putting that safe space poster is a huge slap in my face because I am not out at work because my whole team is homophobic and I hear the things that they say. And you putting up a poster doesn't change them. Now they're laughing at the poster and they're, it's even worse. So what we suggested that they do was engage all of the folks who came forward to say, you know, let's bring them together, let's do a, a, a meeting and talk a little bit about what are some of the challenges that we experience. You know, don't make it mandatory, obviously, but welcome people to a, a chat. And that was the first formation of, you know, that's how they started getting members for their employee resource group, because they were like, we want your help to improve on some of these things. So now that group um, is, is going really, really strong. Um, they've got chapters of their group all over Canada, and it only took them three years. So they went from having really crappy environments to having super engaged staff who are actively working together with HR to present uh, programs around safer spaces all over Canada, across all of their locations. I'm not saying that the company's perfect. I'm not saying that any company's perfect. I think there's still probably a lot of people who say really gross things in the workplace, but now people who hear those gross things have a group that they can go to and talk to about, uh, talk about it with, uh, and kind of work with uh, the you know the corporate HR uh, to try and think of what are some specific solutions that we can do to meet people where they're at on some of these subjects. So we think it's really important for um, for people to uh, for employers to support these groups and listen to them. One of the things that the reason why we say and listen to them is because a lot of companies' uh, strategy is well here's ten thousand dollars, use that for the year, go do a bunch of pub nights and let go and let God. And like that's not really effective because you know doing a bunch of pub nights it's not really helpful for people who got to get home to you know obligations with kids or parents after work. It doesn't really move the needle on any of the stuff that I'm talking about here today. It just kind of pacifies people and gives them some drinking money and I don't think that's a really good use of, of uh, HR dollars. Um, another great thing um, around you know ERGs is that you know we, we think it really does start at the top. Um, we think it's important for there to be an executive sponsor, um, somebody who can kind of cut through some of the bureaucracy and red tape in an organization. Uh, I was working with an organization um, over the summertime because one of the folks from the company got in touch and they said, "Well, we really want to put a pride flag up this year, but I don't know. Um, like, do I talk to the building manager? Like, what's the sign-off process for that?" And I was like, well, I know you're, you're VP of people and culture. Like, do you want me to just call her? And I was like, hey, they want to put up a pride flag. And she said, oh, I never even thought of that. Yeah, let's do it. You know, like sometimes you just have to talk to somebody who kind of has a 360 view of the organization. And the ERG can take those little ideas that seem so massive or like something that might never happen. 
um, and just talk to somebody who's like, oh yeah, that's no big for me. I can do that in five minutes. You know, that that's the that's really um, what's going to make um, some. Of, it's going to give some of what they're doing teeth because you're going to have somebody um, behind them all the way. So it's important for those those leaders to be actively engaged with the group's work and really understand um, the group's priorities so that they can make them the company's priorities as well. The last few things, um, you know, we'll talk about this in the next session, uh, section, but you know, developing a culture of inclusion. Um, so it's not enough to just say we're inclusive. You actually have to do things to help people be more inclusive. So give people the tools to have effective conversations, let people know where they can go to ask questions, put up visible symbols of support where they're warranted. Um, and we always like to tell people, put your money where your mouth is. We are a membership organization, so I love getting those membership dollars from them every year. But I also love it when they actually put money behind things like training or sponsoring other you know, LGBT charities, that kind of thing. Um, and you can't change what you don't measure. So one of the things that um, people I hear all the time is that you know, we can't ask people about their sexual orientation on um, our demographic surveys because it's illegal. It's absolutely not illegal to do that. You can absolutely do that. There's a lot of different ways that you can ask people about you know, whether they're a member of this community, their specific identity, you, know, how the, you, you can give them um, new and interesting ways of identity, uh, identifying how they do gender, um, all that kind of stuff. There's lots of ways that you can do that. You just have to do it in the right way um, so that it's confidential, it's disassociated from any kind of personal profile. Uh, and it really gives you a good look at what's going on. If you have a big company and you do a survey and you find out that you've got good numbers of people um, in you know, like marketing and communications, people who identify as the uh, members of the community, but in another part of the company like IT, you've got nobody, you know, what's that about? You have to say, okay, well, what's going on in the, with the leadership in IT? Why are they not creating an environment where people are, are comfortable disclosing this information or why, are we not, why, don't, why aren't we attracting folks from this community? And that can be said about any marginalized group. It's really important to get that data. You know, for me, um, it's good. when I look at our events, I like to get really granular with the demographic data. We did an event and uh, my board members who were you know, leading that event were all happy. They're like, we had a great, it was 50-50 gender split on this, uh, the demographic survey, Colin. We did a great job with the event. And I was like, okay, well, let's get a little bit deeper. The 50% the that were there that identified as men all identified as gay, and the 50% of women who were there all identified as straight. So we didn't attract any gay women. Um, I didn't see very many people on this, on this survey identify as trans or non-binary. And 85% of the people who attended the event were white. So what, what went wrong in what we were doing with this event? So they were super excited. I kind of popped their balloon. But you know, it's always good to have new challenges so that we can confront and kind of move forward. So we try and flipped it. And you know, the next time we did that event, we saw more diversity in the numbers. Um, and it's something that we see a lot with the events that we do. And you know, we see a lot of guys gravitating to events, more like some of the things that happen in the evening. So we started um, a breakfast program for um, women and non-binary and trans, uh, other trans folks. Um, that's a breakfast program. We have them here in Ottawa. Anybody who'd like to come is more than welcome. You can, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter, and um, you'll get information about them. Uh, and uh, I'm the person who has to deal with all the guys who feel discriminated against because it's a women and trans breakfast. So I always offer to take them out to breakfast myself. Um, <laughs> so we're going to move on. Last little section here. I'm going to try and make this as fun as possible. I know it's really hard to listen to my gay voice this entire time. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about being, being an ally. Um, and then I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. I'm going to try and do this kind of uh, rapid fire. So someone, uh, what's, an, what's an ally? There's some definitions here. Uh, you know, someone who advocates for and supports members of a community, blah, 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 blah. I think an ally is just somebody who knows the right thing to do and tries to do it at all times. That's kind of how I, how I see it. Um, we can get you know, into these definitions. I like to, to think more about um, the characteristics around allies, but you know, there's different words that we use, ally. Some people think it's important to say that they're a straight ally. Um, you know, I, have a, I keep a, a trans uh, flag in my office. I consider myself a, a trans ally. I think of myself as an ally um, to, to women. Uh, you know, super awesome, gift to humanity ally. I think that's getting a little bit big in the head, but um, some people like to use that. So, Rather than think about a definition or like a label that we use, um, my friend Jean Marie, she's the director of equality partnerships at PFLAG uh, National in, in the States. And she came up with this idea of not thinking about um, 
you know, a label or a definition, but here there's some characteristics that allies embody. Um, so allies want to learn, they ad uh, address their barriers, they know that support comes in many forms, uh, and they're diverse. So, you know, allies want to learn. You know, I think a good ally is not the type of person who cuts somebody off and says, don't worry, I already know it. They listen to people, talk about themselves, and then use that language, they mirror that language back to them so that they understand that they listen, they were listening. Um, addressing their barriers, you know, I think if somebody comes up to you, you know, if somebody comes up to me after a talk and they say, uh, you know, you used X, Y word and it didn't sit right with me and I don't like it when people use that word. I mean, the worst thing I can do is say, well, you know, give me a break. I'm doing the best I can, blah, blah, blah. I want to say, oh, tell me more. Why does that word make you feel that way? And what do you think I can do to change my presentation to make it uh, you know, more inclusive? Because I want to make sure that people are focusing on the good stuff that I'm saying and not the things that are making them uncomfortable. So it's really easy to you know, change a little thing in a presentation if it makes somebody feel weird. Or if somebody's like, oh, I've had you know, experiences with that word and explain it. It might change my perspective on things. So you have to address your barriers or, or know your, the spots that you're uncomfortable around. You know, if there's certain subject matter that you're not familiar with, go learn more about it. You know, I'm always trying to find find new courses and things that I can go on so I can learn a little bit more about the things that I don't encounter in my day to day. Um, allies are people who know that support comes in many forms. I think um, sometimes people think that the best way of being an ally is getting out in front of a situation and really shielding people from harm. But I think a lot of the time what allies really need to do is sit back and let people kind of deal with things on their own. So talking about this support piece, um, you know, we have a couple people on our staff who use um, uh, they, them pronouns. They don't use um, he or she. Um, they, uh, they use they, they, them pronouns. So everybody is different. So some of the staff, they, and they're fine with me talking about this as an example. We, we all had a discussion about it. Some of the staff really like it that if somebody uses, you know, misgenders them in an email, they say, you know, Colin, I'd really appreciate it if you address that with the person. Maybe next time you're chatting with them, just casually mention, oh, yeah, like they use they, them pronouns, you know, just, you know, try and remember that. Um, we have it on our email signatures, so it's, it doesn't happen over email. But some people, uh, you know, another staff member, when that happens, they said, you know, I don't want you to mention it at all because it doesn't really bother me. And next time I'm working with that person, I'll mention it to them. Or I'll send them an email and they'll see my signature. Everybody wants to deal with these things in a different way that's comfortable for them. So when you kind of jump in and make a, you know, a judgment call on how that person needs to be helped, you're not being a great ally. And then allies are diverse because they can come in any you know, shape or form or from any background. And like Jean Marie says, identifying as an ally isn't about labeling, it's about expressing an identity. So uh, a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of reasons not to be out at work. Uh, but you can see that, uh, you know, I think a lot of these are to do with some of the ways that we interact with each other in the workplace, assumptions that people make, stereotypes. Um, you know, I think the people might think I might be attracted to them. I get a kick out of uh, that one. Um, you know, not being considered for advancement or development opportunities is a pretty big one. Um, you know, we work with a lot of folks who work in um, financial services, and a big part of advancing your career in financial services is overseas assignments. So if people make assumptions about what countries you do and don't want to go to because of your identity, um, it might really mess up your career. So there's a lot of ways that, that people kind of do missteps. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to try and be a little bit jokey, excuse me for a little while. I'm going to go through a few of the allies that you don't want to be, and I'll explain why as we go through. So. The first one is that I don't call people bad names and I consider myself a good person, so there's no way I'm not an ally ally. These are the people who say, I'm not trying to be homophobic, but, and then they say the most homophobic thing that you've ever heard in your entire life. So people think that because they're not actively cruel to people, that that means that they're an ally. So, you know, just not saying a bad thing isn't the same as saying good things. So it's really important to understand that being an ally is about being actively engaged uh, and you know, say, give, giving positive messages about the community and not just holding back from saying negative things about the community. There's the, the it's not really my problem, so I won't say anything ally. So like I said, there's a time and place for when you got to step in. And sometimes people don't like you too. But you know, if you're in a situation where it's not about defending a specific person or looking to them about what kind of support they need, it's just a bunch of people who are in a room saying things that are really gross, then you know, being that person who says, you know, a lot of what you're saying doesn't really jive with some of the policies that we have around here or the culture that we're trying to create, 
um, can we talk about why you're saying those things or you know, talk about why you're using that language? Uh, because if you're an ally and you're trying to cultivate a culture of inclusion, it is your problem if somebody is saying something negative. Because if they're saying something negative about a group that you don't necessarily belong to, you know, it's only a matter of time before you start hearing things about you know, people like you. So it's really, it's really important to, to step in when you, when you hear people saying uh, negative stuff. The, I should say something, but I might say the wrong thing and offend someone, so it's best if I just shut up, ally. I hear this a lot. So people say, you know, I want to ask questions or I want to say something, but I just feel like it's better coming from you know, somebody else who has more training and education. If something's not sitting right with you, you have a right to talk about why it's not sitting right with you. Don't worry about whether or not you're articulating it perfectly or you're you know, quoting the Ontario Human Rights Code effectively. Um, it doesn't need to be that you know, prescriptive. Um, and you know everybody makes mistakes all the time. You might say the wrong thing, or you might use the wrong word. Uh, but I think you know so that's part of a learning process too. Um, so you know sometimes it's about admitting you know maybe I don't have all of the information on this, but I know that what you're saying or what you're doing um, is not cool. So I'm going to talk to you about it, even though. I'm admitting that I might not have all of the language. Um, and sometimes it's about, you know, if you don't feel like you have all the right language, it's about going and getting it and coming back and revisiting the situation with a person. Um, the next one's kind of my favorite. It's that I have a gay friend, and he told me his opinion. So I use uh, what he thinks to stand in for the opinions of all queer and trans people, because that makes total sense, ally. These are the people who they think because they heard one queer person say something one time, that you know that means that they can say whatever they can say whatever came out of that person's mouth. I've worked in this community for a long time, and I know a lot of folks, um, you know, uh, cis folks who identify as gay and lesbian, who say some pretty gross uh, transphobic and biphobic things. Um, we just did a research project on biphobia within the community, and some of the research I, I saw uh, said that. Some people who identify as, as bi or, or pansexual, they said that when they come out to somebody who is a member of the community, so somebody who is, is you know, gay uh, or lesbian of, of any uh, gender identity or any gender, um, and they're not immediately met with a negative comment, they see that as a positive. So that's really sad that just somebody not saying, oh, that, you're not bi, that's a phase, or you just can't decide, or you'll be gay soon enough. People not saying those things immediately when that person comes out, they saw that as like the best thing that ever happened. Uh, and that's not something I like to hear because uh, you know, it's bad enough that uh, we have a lot of you know, hate and, and stuff coming from outside of the community. But for people to be encountering that within their own community that's supposed to really understand and support them is not cool. So uh, I don't like it when, when, when people use this idea of, you know, my brother is, is queer and, uh, you know, he hates lesbians, so it's not, it's not bad for me to make lesbian jokes. I mean, it's just bad to make those jokes. So uh, don't let other people's um, identities justify your poor behavior. The, I took one workshop, and quite frankly, I have a better handle on things than um, even most queer people ally. These are the people who do like a webinar or something, and then they know. And these are the people that I find to be those, those identity detectives. Those are the ones who say, aha, she's holding hands with a woman. She's a lesbian. I got it. I get a point. And like, that's kind of how they encounter the world. Because I know that we, we live in a world that's very much associated with boxes. And you know, you've got a, a women's section and a men's section and a men's bathroom and a women's bathroom. And then you know, you're filling out forms and you're constantly checking off you know, Caucasian or, uh, you know, like, uh, or you know, black. Like, like every, everything's about checking boxes and identifying and categorizing everybody. Um, but we don't need to categorize everybody to have a human conversation and treat people with respect. And you don't need to know somebody specific, how do you identify your gender? How do you identify your sexual orientation in order to just be supportive and be like, how is your weekend? Or like, do you have that file? Like, you, you don't really need to understand the nitty gritty of how somebody identifies to just know, oh, they use uh, the pronouns they use are they, them. So I'll use those. Uh, oh, I got an email that um, so and so uh, used to use this name. Now they're using this name. I should probably remember to use that name because that's their name. You know, little things like that. Just that's showing respect for people beyond you know understanding all these definitions and and trying to one up each other with knowledge. The 
it's better if I talk about this stuff because straight people need to hear it from someone like them ally. So this could also be that it's better if I talk about this stuff because cis people need to hear it from someone like them. Uh, you know, I do think that there's a big role that allies can play in advocacy. I have a lot of folks who are, you know, cis straight folks who are great allies for our community. Uh, I work with a bunch of um, CFL players out in Calgary who do talks at our events uh, out west, and it's really, really helpful to have them there because it gets people to our events who might not usually come to our events, um, and then they hear more about the community, and it's really great. Uh, so I do think that there's a big, a big role that, that folks can play. But and I do think you know sometimes you know we've got uh, some we've got a lot of people on our team and uh, you know usually when we like to do presentations on stuff that's really specific to trans communities we really like to have somebody with that lived experience um, give the talk but sometimes it just doesn't work out like that and one of the cisgender folks on our team needs to go deliver the content um, with input from from you know folks in our various committees um, and that's that's you know that's how it works um, but we don't think that that is always the case we do think that there's a uh, there's a lot to be said um, for having folks speak from their own experience and, and you know, really inform the content that we deliver or the content that anybody delivers um, from a lived experience uh, standpoint. Uh, you know, that being said, one of the things that we really do advocate is that you know, if you are going to get somebody to come and talk about their personal experience, it's really important to set some ground rules around what they are and aren't willing to talk about. Uh, we know what kind of questions they're going to take, and we do really think it's important to provide some sort of honorarium or payment if people are going to come and do a presentation around their, their lived experience. So a um, little bit about uh, presentations there. But generally, you know, the, these are the things that we're fighting against uh, by you know, trying not to be all these allies, you know, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, stereotypes, prejudices, heterosexism, uh, cis-sexism. Uh, cis -sexism. Um, these are the types of things that we're trying to combat by being good allies and, and not being those kind of bad kind of allies that I, I ran through. Um, that's all I have for formal presentation. Um, thanks for being such a good uh, group. I do want to open it up for questions. If people have uh, you know, specific questions about stuff that I talked about uh, or anything else that you think I could be helpful with. <coughs> Sip of coffee. I'll just turn myself on here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, th first of all, thank you very much uh, for this. I found this very informative. So thank oh, you for thank coming you. in today. Um, I have a question regarding, um, you know, sometimes um, encountering people who, uh, in the straight community, who say, "Hey, will you guys have gay marriage now? Um, you're protected by uh, in Ontario and Canada for, uh, you know, human rights. Sexual orientation is identified." Uh, there, so everything's good. So why why do we continue to talk about this? Because obviously everything's good in Canada. Yeah. Um, how how would you approach talking to these people to say, um, well, actually we have a lot of work uh, that remains ahead of us. Yeah. Well, I, whenever that ha that happens to me a lot, you know, like I have a lot of people who like, well, aren't there always going to be challenges? So like, why even do this work? And I'm like, yeah, but like, there are always going to be challenges, so we're always going to be working against them. Um, I don't really like, I think some people try and say, like, they try and relate to people where they are and kind of s talk to them about their experience and compare it. What I do is I talk about the reason, like, everything that we do at, at my work, we do because there's some sort of data that tells us that we need to be doing that work. So when we did our, uh, you know, we launched our women in trans, uh, like, breakfast program, it's because we didn't see, we see, like, you know, a lot, a lot more money in Canada going to uh, groups that serve um, cis gay men than any other group in the in the community. Um, you know, we see uh, increased poverty among um, queer and trans women than any other uh, group in uh, in, uh, in the community. Um, so there's all these things. You know, we see a lot more unemployment and all that stuff. So there's all these um, like data driven pieces that told us, well, we need to start putting together programs that target this community. So I just talk about that. Like, I talk about what drives the work that we do. Because we don't, I mean, we have to report back to our members and the folks who give us money. And if they say, you know, well, why did you do this series of events? And I just say, oh, we just thought it would be fun. Like, we just thought it would be a cool thing to do. They're never going to give us money again. So everything that we do, we have a rationale for. So I try and focus more on those rationales. Um, and I do think that with some people, you can tell some people rates of suicide, and for some reason, it just never and just never touches ground for them. Like they just, it doesn't sink in for them, or it's it's so outside of their experience because they don't know anybody from the community, or they don't have a relationship with anybody from the community. So, 
Sometimes it's about you know, kind of talking about those data points. And depending on the situation, sometimes I just say, because I'm a member of this community and I feel these things every day, and a lot of people that I love are members of this community, and they feel these things every day, and that's why we do the work that we do. So you know, trying to meet them at an emotional level sometimes really helps. Um, but you know, because my job is usually about justifying things through data and you know, outcomes, that's usually what I focus on. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but. And and I and I do and I do want to make a comment on that. I find it a, an odd thing that there's a microphone and that there's a camera here with a wide angle lens, just in general. Oh. You know, it's and a choice. So, um, because there's a lot of photo ops at at the school. So, but I just want to ask if Credit Works Algonquin is a member, mm -hmm. and your work with Algonquin College at this point, what is it? <laughs> Or how is that developing? Oh, there's a, a bunch of things that we do with our members. So half of what we do um, with our programming is to engage with employees. Uh, and then the other half we do is to kind of engage with the organization as an employer. So a couple of the things that we do to engage with employees, um, we do our public programs. So we do in-person events. Uh, you know, we do our, our breakfast program. We'll do panel discussions. We'll do kind of like uh, you know workshops. Um, we give sometimes those are only open to employees uh, of our members, and sometimes they're open to the general public. Um, we also do a webinar series that's exclusive for employees uh, uh, of our of our network. Um, so we do those. You know, we do eight English language webinars a year. We do four French language webinars a year. Um, um, and those are, you know, a chance for folks to kind of tune in on a regular basis to get um, information on, um, you know, really specific parts of the community as we go. Um, and then we offer, you know, opportunities um, through our partners. So sometimes some of the employers that we work with will do an event in a region, and they'll make it open only to people who are part of our network, that sort of thing. So we have a newsletter that we send out. We post everything on our website. We make really clear what's open to um, employees of our members and what's not. So we do some things to engage there. Um, for our, uh, empl uh, our employer partners that have employee resource groups, we also can work directly with them. So, you know, sometimes we'll send a staff member for, you know, a little working meeting to help guide their strategy, that sort of thing. Um, when we work with employers, uh, what we usually do is we advise through our benchmarking program. So we collect information about what the employer is doing and then give them some uh, uh, you know, short-term um, uh, opportunities for growth and some like longer-term priorities that we think that sh they should focus on. So that's usually done kind of with the HR or diversity inclusion area. Uh, and then we also do, you know, as we go kind of ad hoc, um, you know, support for, you know, if an event's happening, we connect them with speakers that might, you know, work for the specific audience that they're working with. Um, sometimes we'll review documents, you know, if there's a new piece of training that's being rolled out, we'll, we're happy to review it and provide um, some, some uh, edits on. So every employer that we work with is obviously structured very differently. Um, so we do have a different working relationship with, with every uh, one, of our, one of our partners. So it's a little bit about what we do. Are you working with an employee? <laughs> So we are doing a lot of work in this space, but again, we have only been members since August, yeah. I want to say. So we are early in our journey. So we have been posting up the monthly webcasts. Yeah. They're available, so every month you can learn about a different aspect of inclusion in this area. We have our Inclusion and Diversity Circle, which meets six times a year to identify barriers and try to work through them. We're working with the Pride Center to identify any events or any ways to collaborate really from an employee perspective. Um, and we are working with some of the faculty and chairs to implement some training ad hoc on demand. So, you know, we are only a couple months into this journey and I'd be happy to hear what you think we should be doing next. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, if I can... Yeah, if I if I could add if I could add to that comment, um, I think those are fantastic. Uh, this feels very much to me a, a very sort of a ground up approach, uh, which is required for sure. Um, I'd be curious to know what the strategy is to get this from a top down approach. So, like this whole presentation that you're doing now on the fifth floor, for example, I feel would be very effective. Uh, and getting um, you know more more at that leadership level 
getting everyone on board um, and uh, you know just seeing what comes of it uh, uh, from there yeah and that fits in with one of our recommendations <laughs> and that fits in with one of our recommendations it starts at the top yeah. so yeah we uh, you know we always we always see that very clearly from a lot of the organizations that we work with that you know, it takes a lot of really good engagement from employees who really know the workplace, uh, you know, from a day-to-day -day perspective. Um, because if it only comes from the top, then it's really a strategy that's built on assumptions um, and a lot of the time stereotypes. Um, so we do see that a lot of employers are really successful when they've got, you know, a group of well-supported, um, uh, you know, employees who can really talk about what some of the issues or opportunities that they see in their day to day um, that has effective communication with leadership who can actually clear the way for some of those things to happen. So. And I'd say that we do have that leadership in place. Um, our uh, executive sponsor is the vice president of HR. Um, every time that I've gone up to say we want money to join Pride at Work Canada, we want to participate in the Pride Parade, I want to put this session on. Every single time, there's been unanimous support and funds put behind that. Um, so there's a commitment. I hear what you're saying about making sure that we provide more learning at the top, but there is absolutely interest and commitment from the executive team on continuing the conversation around inclusion. Mm -hmm. If anyone else wants to jump in, go ahead. I don't want to hog the mic <laughs> during this whole thing. Here. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming here and just giving of your experience and um, using some of the experiences that you've lived, as you say. I just want to shout out for the podcasts that have um, that have started uh, getting through the college. I listened to one all about erasure, and when you mentioned um, that experience of someone within the community. Um, being denied who they are by mm. someone else in the community, that kind of blew my mind. <laughs> I, I experience, um, we all experience prejudice all around us. We see it, we hear it, but somehow we think that, or I thought that that community was protected from that and mm -hmm. safe. And to understand through that podcast, because I would have had no idea if I hadn't sat and listened during my lunch hour, um, that that terrible um, assault could happen within that community was really powerful for me. And it really um, opened my mind to ha how I can't understand really because I'm not in their shoes, but mm -hmm. I could empathize with them. Yeah. And so that was meaningful for me. And that's, that's why I think these sessions, understanding more about the community, um, it just helps us relate as fellow human beings rather than labels and I just want to thank you very much and thank you to Sarah for putting this all together it's just been fantastic oh thanks for sharing that that's great yeah Um, I, f I feel there's there's one thing maybe that um, we haven't talked about that affects faculty specifically um, in the classroom is that um, we also can be affected in our workplace by students uh, that are around us. And I know there's a whole conversation that, it, that goes on for students about inclusiveness and things like that. But myself as a teacher, actually, I've had, I've had an encounter like that. I've been... Uh, I, I had an incident where I had some students that were incredibly homophobic and when I called them out on it they were actually very aggressive with me mm. um, and I was just wondering perhaps what uh, what you think about or is there is there is there a conversation around that about about faculty um, just a consideration perhaps for for the LGBT uh, Q2 plus faculty who are in the classroom mm -hmm. and facing that it's, it's certainly something that we see a lot, uh, you know, across different employment situations because, you know, uh, faculty have to interact with students and contractors and, uh, you know, anybody else who's working in the environment. Similarly, you know, some people uh, work with, uh, you know, customer, like, you know, working with customers or, 
going into other office environments, you know, consultants or lawyers having to go into somebody else's office. Um, so it's really important, we think, from, you know, when we talk about that putting things in writing and, and creating policies, um, we think it's really important for those policies to reflect kind of the real lives of people in the organization and really address a lot of um, the different interactions that people might have. Um, that's why if a company or an employer gets in touch with us and says, oh, do you have like a copy of a policy around harassment discrimination, we don't give them a, a template to use. We just, it's just not something that we do because um, we really encourage um, employers to you know, build policies and guidelines that reflect the you know, lived environment of, of everybody um, who's there. Um, so you know, taking a template from one company and putting it in another uh, you know, uh, structure, it's not always effective. So that's why we do think that you know, it's important to have um, guidelines for dealing with issues around the eventualities that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, it's something that we see in a lot of school environment, like you know, school, college, university environments, um, certainly because you've got a lot of different stakeholder groups. And it's something that we see uh, you know, in companies that have a, you know, a retail area as well as a manufacturing area. You know, they have all these different environments. So I think in general, the diversity inclusion strategies that we see uh, that are very you know, broadly uh, disseminated, they really did start in office environments with people who I like to call car carpet dwellers, you know, people who live in a, a cushy, they have a cushy <laughs> office window, they have access to a computer all day, they have access to a phone all day, they have a work email that's associated with their job. Um, and that's where a lot of these initiatives started, and that's uh, where they gained a lot of traction. But I think the, the work that a lot of places have to do now is make sure that the broad concepts are being felt in different environments as well. So you know, taking the things that might work in an office, tweaking them so that they work on a factory floor, so that they work in a college environment, that sort of thing, uh, and making sure you're not just like photocopying a policy, changing the name of the employer at the top, and, and sending it out to people. Um, I think, too, one of the things that, like I said, similar to the conversation about focusing on um, identities, is that you know, I, I, I always try and talk about getting away from this idea of talking about you know, defining identities and start talking about the behavior that we want to see and modeling the behavior that we want to see and, and talking about you know, solutions for encouraging positive behavior and positive interactions. Um, so getting away from those, you know, when we talk about you know, further education that's rolled out by the employer, we don't want to see sessions that are just, here's all the identities and here's the definitions. We want to see you know, case studies of, you know, here are some things that happen in environments like ours, and here's a ways of, of dealing with it. So giving people tools to have those effective interactions and, and, and problem solve um, in their real environment rather than just kind of some abstract you know, ideas about, you know, what different identities are. Yeah. Does that kind of address what it is that you're talking about? Somewhat, yeah. 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 Um, so in terms of the question, uh, so there is a diversity committee here at Old Boston College, correct? And kind of how is membership uh, determined for, for that to, to work on policies to change, say, things like gender? Yes, yeah, so we have a 15-member inclusion and diversity circle. Um, so the membership for that was identified. Uh, we did an open call to the community and asked people to put up their hands, come forward, that they would want to work on this. So uh, the group is founded in being able to respond to employment equity. So we have membership from the four groups that fall under the Employment Equity Act. But additionally, we have union representation, we have union stewards, we have faculty um, that aren't representing the union, sitting just as faculty members. From schools, we have management, we have chairs. Um, yeah, so we have very purposefully been very broad in that. Um, and just Monday, we submitted the first draft of the Inclusion and Diversity Policy. It's going to ACLT, which is the Algonquin College Leadership Team, deans, directors, and the executive team on November 15th. And we hope that that will be moved through the many steps that it takes to get a policy approved at the Board of Governors. But that is in place, and it does actually include um, a commitment and a call to action around training at every level and resourcing that training. So that's the group. Um, if there's something specific that you want to get involved in, we'd be happy to, I'd be happy to have that conversation, see if there's, there's a fit somewhere, because expertise is always welcome. 
So it all gone though if, if if there's an issue like the one Jed just highlighted. Mm -hmm. If um, if you were concerned about that, he would send that to you. Uh, no, that instance would either go to an HR business partner or to the ombudsman. My role is not to mediate or do anything under the HR 22 respect in the workplace policy when you get into a discrimination investigation. We have uh, usually external investigators that come in and do that specific work. Um, but there are triggers to support that sort of incident should we want to follow it through some processes. Otherwise, again, it's just the awareness and the learning that we're trying to do. And I know Quinn does a lot of work in that area as well, specifically with students. Um, so we can always, but we can always do better. So open yeah, up no, ideas just, and suggestions. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm better aware of the need more at the student center. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering more about the employee group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Any other questions that I can help with? <laughs> So I'm just I'm thinking about a situation where um, it's kind of the opposite to what Jed mentioned, and that was, and you know, it's a situation where a, a, an employee is called out by students for inappropriate language, mm -hmm. which happens, right? Especially when they're older generation <laughs> teachers; they've been around forever, and their jokes are old, and mm -hmm. you know, tend to be off color. Let's say. Yeah. So, but rather than rather than the approach being, you know, the, um, one of kindness, this is not not appropriate. Let's see how we can change that and and bring that person over to become an ally. Mm -hmm. It's 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 discriminatory in that it's you're a bad person. That's terrible. You shouldn't be saying those things. And now that you know, it, it creates just this animosity, and you you cannot. You, I don't know. We can't. We can't create allies that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have to do it in a way where where people are, are feeling, oh yeah, you know that, and we're self reflective. That, that's that's yeah. not appropriate, and I'm going to change that. And thank you for telling me. Oh you know, yeah. Those that kind of approach. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I do think it's really important to recognize for sure that in every instance where we've got people, you know, saying things that make other people uncomfortable or can be discriminatory. You know, the, uh, I get asked questions um, all the time about, well, what if this happens, and then what if this happens, and then what would you do? And I just think, you know, there are so many what ifs here that, you know, when you do a human rights investigation, you have to look at every all the facts for as they are, and you have to understand that there's history and emotions and, you know, you know, personal relationships involved in all of these incidents, and each of them does need to be dealt with, like, you know, in their own in their own way. Um, but I do think that, you know, the point that you're making about, um, you know, trying to separate the emotions from the incident and really focus on what's the issue here? Is it that this person doesn't have the tools to have these conversations effectively? Or is it that they have the tools and they're choosing not to use them? Or is it they have a whole other set of tools that are being used in a negative way? And, you know, trying to assess what is the best way of finding a res resolution here for whoever's got the issue. So I think you're absolutely right. You know, these things are much more complicated than we give them credit for, which is why, you know, when we talk about ally programs um, or, you know, visible symbols of support for the community, um, I'm not a huge fan of just handing out rainbow flags to everybody um, without telling those folks, you know, what it means or, you know, ally buttons or something like that. It's really important for folks to get some sort of training or education or background in what that means so that not just so that they, you know, when people go to them, they kind of say the right things. But to really help people understand, you know, I don't want a whole bunch of people in my workplace wearing an ally button and then somebody saying, what does that mean? And be like, I don't know, HR gave it to me. You know, it, it kind of loses that oomph when, when people are kind of, uh, you know, they don't have any excitement around what it means or, oh yeah, I did some training and I figured out, you know, how I could help create an inclusive environment and they gave me this button. You know, helping people become those active allies who can really help in those situations. It's one of the reasons why we really do encourage there to be some sort of, um, you know, task in front of getting a visible symbol like that. So when people go to folks for help on situations like the ones that you're talking about, um, they can be truly impactful. Yeah. It's kind of like doing the positive space training and then having the card that you put on your door. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Do you really know how to, how to be and to have, how to talk and what to say and how to be that, that safe person that, that you can go to? 
Yeah. I used to work at George Brown College in Toronto and uh, worked on the positive space training program there. And I would often tell the story. I remember when I was in high school uh, years ago, um, I went to a counselor because a friend of mine was being bullied. And he, the counselor had a rainbow flag on his, on his door. And I went in and I talked about, well, my friend's being bullied. And his response was, well, maybe if he wasn't so vocal about being gay, people wouldn't give him such a problem. So, you know, he was giving me an answer that was completely antithetical to having the rainbow flag on his door. Uh, and I do know that at the school that I went to, things have changed drastically and things are doing a lot better there now these years later. Uh, but that always really did motivate me when people said, well, I don't really want to do the training. Can I just have the thing to put on my desk? And I would tell them that story. And I'd be like, you know, do you really want to make a student or a colleague feel that way when they come into your office? And it's a really good way of motivating people to actually do the training and, you know, get the content so that they can really be those active allies. Because you don't want to send those false flags and, and develop, you know, ill will uh, among the, the, you know, folks who are supposed to be working positively together. So, yeah. I think that should be pos um, ongoing. Yeah. Just because you took it two years ago doesn't mean it's still, right? It just needs, it's, it's got to be, it's got to be something that you live and practice and mm -hmm. do so that it's not just a thing in the window. I got to do first aid training every two years <laughs> to keep, you know, to keep certified. <laughs> So, and uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian Mental Health Association does their uh, mental health first aid. You got to do that every couple of years too, because stuff changes, you're right. So you got to, you, it's, a, it's muscle, you got to keep working all the time. Well, I think it's okay. 10 o'clock, so we should probably wrap up because I know you're all excited to go off to the President's Coffee Break, which is why I'm wearing a suit at the moment. Ridiculous outfit today. <laughs> <laughs> I invite you all to uh, thank our fabulous speaker, Colin. Thanks so much for coming in and sharing all that information and if you have any more questions or want to have any conversations with, with me offline you can always text me by email I'm in the MyAC system um, thank you very much thanks for having me
have think have thought about their needs and they don't necessarily think about the needs of others. So I do think you know it's about kind of getting it's about getting them the help that they need, right? So um, sometimes that's about counseling programs that are kind of get to these uh, issues, but it's also about letting them know that they need to be vocal about when they're hearing these things. And you know, one of the good things that happens to us is that you know if somebody says something. At one of our events, yeah. um, you know, we had the event in Calgary, and then we had some folks there from the newcomer program, and one of them was treated not very nicely by one of our guests. I was able to find out who that guest was, and just let them know, just so you know, that behavior is not tolerated by us at our events, and if I hear about it again, we'll be attending. So I think there's a lot of folks who want to do things like that, but they need they need somebody to reach out and talk about the experiences that they've had. So I would encourage them to be as vocal as possible to people who can make a difference, because um, that's kind of the yeah, only way to, yeah. and I know it's always, it's tough for folks who are, who are new to Canada. Yeah, to that, right? it's interesting that you said vocal, because as much as they want to, on top of the language barriers, yeah. um, they, there's the personality and then the, the, yeah. the cultural barriers as well. And the, like, you know, lack of a good relationship with authority in the country that they came from. Yeah. They're not used to being able to make, yeah, so we like to yeah. let people know, you know, we, or like with, within workplace we always say, you know, it's really important to make sure that people know what avenues are open to them. So make it really clear, you know, if you have an issue, yeah, you go to the student uh, center, you go to yeah. HR, you go to whatever. Um, but it's also about really advocating to make sure that, you know, a lot of the spaces that we create for, you know, gender and sexual minorities are inclusive of, all, of everyone, you know. We see events, it's like 90% men, that's no good for women to come to. We see them at 85% white, there's going to be a lot of racism there. So, yeah, I think it's that kind of constant communication loop about, like, this is an issue, um, but I do think that um, the most immediate thing would be trying to connect them with somebody who can guide them to, you know, here are some tools or, or stuff. So I, if you email me, I'll see what I can um, scrounge up and, and send to you. Yeah. And um, I, I do know that, like, um, it's just something that's faced a lot of college and university communities have faced. Um, I think, um, you know, George Brown College, where I used to work, they've got a couple of great programs, so if you email me, I can send you um, some of the web, like, website, some of the stuff that they do. Do you think uh, any of the resources that you have might be my multiple? Uh, we do things in English and French, yeah. um, but we don't do, we can't afford to translate things into any other language, it's very limited in our yeah, resources. I, yeah, I yeah. understand that. Yeah. yeah, the specific group I was referring to, they, they don't speak French, that French or yeah, the French. Yeah. So that's part of the reason why they feel they're really restricted mm. in localizing. Can I ask yeah. what uh, what languages they speak? Yeah, they speak Chinese. Chinese? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. There's, so a, there's a group in, that we work with in Toronto called uh, Asian Community Aid Services. Okay. Um, and they do... So so we yeah, find uh, a lot of the data that they have show that uh, you know Asian uh, men in, in, in Toronto are like disproportionately impacted by HIV because you know people um, they're really excited to come to Canada but they don't necessarily know how to practice the safe sex, the safe sex right um, so we there's you know some some education they do around safe sex and STIs and all that stuff but they also do some stuff around um, anti racism and Great. some okay. things they do. So if you email me yeah. and remind me of our chat, yeah. um, I'll see if I can inundate you with some reading <laughs> materials. Okay. Um, and then some people that you can chat with. But I do think Asian Community Aid Services, they have some great stuff. They're a pretty small, like, volunteer-run organization. But, and I know that they're in Toronto, but they do, you know, have stuff that they can send. Um, you know, I know the Rainbow Resource Center in Winnipeg, um, they do a lot of stuff um, for newcomers as well. The 519, I know that there is a center here in Ottawa that does some stuff. So I have a contact for there, actually, so I could provide that to you as well. Yeah. Okay. So you email me. This is usually what we do. We have employees okay. from the companies who are but they say, I have a question about this. And yeah. I'm like, here's like 18 links for you to follow. If you yeah. have questions after that, you come back to me. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Thank What's you your very name? Much. Sorry? Wenching. Wenching. Nice to meet you, Wenching. Nice Wen to meet you. Wen yeah. It was a very great talk. Oh, thanks very really much. Really, yeah. Oh, awesome. awesome. Yeah. And we'll get you some help for those folks because uh, I completely understand where they're coming from. Yeah. yeah. It's really <laughs> tough for them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. See you later. See you. That was great. Thank oh, you very much. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah. yeah enjoyed it. Yeah. And thanks for the book. Sure. Yeah. I was thinking of books. She's easy to find on like, yeah, yeah, website yeah. online. So this is great. Yeah, I uh, looked at the thing. Uh, I um, I uh, was talking. So we had this roundtable of women executives um, in Toronto with the uh, Tegan. Do you know Tegan and Sarah? I, I, yes. Yeah. 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 Sort so, of, yeah. yeah. So they did the law. They have a foundation here in Canada. I know a big thing for them is books. Okay. Um, and uh, the big thing that we hear a lot from parents is they want books that are like. Um, 
that they can give kids like on subjects like this, right. or even just books that have, like it's not necessarily part of the main storyline, but it's just that it's, there's, it's two moms, but that's sure. not the focus of the book. Right. So anytime I hear about books like this, I have like people like in my network that I can kind of promote it to. Right, yeah. What publisher are they with? Uh, Greystone with books? Greystone oh, in this Vancouver. Is great. Oh, okay, yeah, great. Greystone's in Vancouver. And um, yeah, her agent is in Toronto. Oh, okay. Um, so she's actually going to be in Toronto. Like, if you, you know, if you're interested, if you have questions for her, you know, she's her website's online. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah I might get in touch. Her. Yeah, we got a. There's a new book that just got published from Simon and Schuster called um, "Gender: Your Guide," and it's okay. all focused on gender. Right. And um, there's a couple other books that have come out in the last year or so that focus on this. And um, a big piece for us is not just supporting. Um, folks who are members of the community, but parents of members of the community, because mm -hmm. if I go talk at a corporate environment, most of the uh, questions I get are like, if I have a friend whose daughter just came out, and I'm like, it's, I know it's, you're the friend, <laughs> um, but people are always, or you know, people are trying to find more ways of, you know, getting in with their kids on the ground floor and making sure that they're hip to all this stuff. So mm -hmm. we might do something about, we're doing more programming about parenting and, and all that kind right, of stuff. Right. So we might see if there's a way that we can promote this, but certainly oh, I'll see yeah, if we can. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. She said, I mean, she has had really interesting feedback from the healthcare community and yeah, education yeah. as well as, you know, just people said, I needed this book, you know, four yeah. years ago, you know, when my brother came out, my parents, but she's, you know, my uh, parents are still around, so yeah. you know she's had interesting feedback from, like you know she sort of references, oh well you know my niece and nephew who are under ten, yeah. you know relate to this book and and actually you know a lot of the terms are very familiar for them, which is really great. Yeah. Um, but you know my eighty year old grandfather is also has learned something. Yeah. You know, from this. So. That's great. So anyways, and it's very her whole thing is that it's very um, simple. It's very. Uh, accessible, you know, that it's just, you know, there's nothing that anybody's going to, you know, obviously it would still be for a very young child. Yeah. In terms of reading it, it would still be. Well, I think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's cool too. Uh, it, this it was, is great. It was so funny. You know, sitting at the table with the, um, the people from the Dowling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Did you, you must know them, I guess. Oh, I invited them, yeah. I yeah. had a meeting there yesterday. Okay. And I mentioned, oh, I'm doing a thing. And Sarah said it was okay if I invited them. So, right, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Roberto, who was sitting at the end, yeah. I, I just put the book down when I sat down and he said, oh, I used to coach Ray. And I was like, that was like, I was like, where did you coach her? She was a swimmer. Oh, that's um, funny. And he used to coach her when she was like, you know, oh, 10, that's funny. 12, 14. I was like, oh. I was like, he was like, here's my card to say hi. Because yeah. he'd seen the book uh, through social media, oh, but he didn't have it. Oh, and okay. One of the other people from Dowling, she said, well, this is great because I have a family where I have an 18 year old and a three year old, and this is like the perfect, you know, oh, just that's awesome. yeah, everybody. So it's yeah. just a fun. Oh, this is great. Of. Yeah, thanks for reaching out and providing oh, this sure, to me. Yeah, I really yeah, appreciate the free coffee. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'll, <laughs> I'll let her know, yeah. certainly. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions uh, for her, um, sure. she's going to do so, she's doing some promo in Toronto next week. She got invited to um, CTV Morning. Oh, wonderful. Which was cool, and Global News. So she's doing them both on the same oh, day. Oh, that's on great. Tuesday, so. Yeah. So that's, that's amazing. Yeah, it's just uh, oh, yeah. Great. It's just oh, wonderful. Kind of evolved as a project that she did just for fun, really.